So basically, uh, what I'm going to tell you is first of all, give you an idea of how many RNA binding proteins there are. Because until the early 1990s, if you were doing a simple purification of proteins binding to RNA, you see that uh, the picture you would get by doing a two-dimensional STS page analysis would be that most RNA is uh, coupled to uh, 20 or 30 proteins, which are known as the HNRFPs, and they were known as the RNA histones. Uh, but this uh, situation really has changed dramatically in recent years, because I just want to point out a very recent uh, analysis made by Matthias Henze, where he, without any bias, he went and looked for the RNA binding proteins that could be isolated from a very simple experimental system that is HeLa cells. And if you see, uh, at the end of a huge work, uh, proteomic and purification analysis, what he basically uh, found is that if you look at the RNA binding proteins, he saw that only 144 of the ones that were found in this analysis we actually knew something about, and of course these 144 contained all the HNRMP proteins that I've shown you before. Another 222, we could have predicted that they were binding RNA because they contain domains that are uh, specifically uh, used by proteins to bind RNA. Some of them had something to do with RNA because they were in databases classified as RNA related. And another almost uh, uh, 300 and even more actually were binding to RNA, but we could not have predicted, according to the knowledge we have now, that these were RNA binding. And so the, the, the take-home message of all these studies is that there is a huge amount of proteins <coughs> inside our nuclei that can bind RNA. And in some ways, this is not you know, very surprising, because as soon as uh, the RNA molecule is transcribed from the gene, it is immediately coated by this huge number of RNA binding proteins, that are uh, basically there in order to protect it from degradation, but also to mediate uh, all the different stages of uh, a classic mRNA life cycle that start with the transcription and, like uh, Lynn has just explained, go down to the uh, eventual degradation surveillance, then export to the cytoplasm, and even, and even translation. And you can see that uh, an, RNA, an mRNA, uh, it is uh, it's processed, it's transported, it's translated. Uh, all these RNA binding proteins are necessary because depending on the cell type, they will decide how this RNA is processed, uh, how efficiently it is uh, uh, transported, how efficiently it is translated, and how quickly it is degraded. So uh, this is where likely to be most important, in the place where there is, the, in absolute, the highest amount of RNA processing events, and that is neurons. And you can see here, from a very recent uh, review by Jean Yeo at UCSF, where basically in all the different uh, regions of a neuron, starting from the nucleo but down to the axon and to the synapses, there is a huge amount of RNA binding proteins that are doing a very essential job in not just mediating the processing, but also mediating the way that neurons uh, talk to each other. That, as you can imagine, <coughs> is the most essential uh, function of a neuron in order to make uh, our brains work. And so, uh, uh, what happens if, some, if something happens to these RNAs? What happens? Do we develop disease or not? Um, in order to address uh, partially at least this question, what I'm going to tell you is a little bit some of the work we have been doing in the, in the lab on amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So, a very brief, brief background on amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. This is not a very young disease. It has actually been described for the first time in the 19th century by Charcot, who established <coughs> the first uh, uh, clinical signs and clinical physiological description of the disease, many of which are still in use today. So this is, you know, an idea of how good this guy was. 
without knowing anything about molecular biology or so to define uh, a, a specific disease. In the United States, uh, ALS is also known as Lou Gehrig disease because uh, this was a very famous baseball player who died young by this disease and therefore the disease is also known by this name. And basically what happens in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is that you have a selective loss of motor neurons. And these motor neurons can either be the upper motor neurons, so the ones that are present in the cortex, but also in the spinal motor neurons. And depending on which of these motor neurons die first, the patients will develop a certain uh, uh, series of symptoms which in the end uh, all come to a eventual death uh, because of uh, uh, respiratory failure. But what happens also, and this is the most, uh, I would say, in a way tragic uh, uh, characteristic of ALS, is that until the late stages of the disease, this uh, uh, death uh, of the motor neuron is actually causing a, a weakness of the body, but does not impair absolutely <coughs> the higher functions, brain functions. So these people are cognitively intact until the end. Now, what is happening, oh, there, there, and now we know of course that there are also lots of extrapyramidal and cerebellar neurons during this, uh, this disease. But what happens at the level of the brain? What happens at the level of the neurons? Well, since uh, uh, the beginning, every one of observation that was very clear from the physiology of the brain of the patients is that you had this ubiquitinated protein that normally was uh, uh, residing in the nucleus where presumably it was doing something with RNA, and in the patients you can see that this protein is aberrantly translocated to the cytoplasm and also it was clear, uh, it was also uh, ubi aberrantly ubiquitinated and obviously it was probably either not capable of doing the functions that it was doing in the nucleus, but also maybe it was gaining some novel functions when it was aberrantly aggregated in the cytoplasm of the neurons. So for around 10 or 15 years, nobody knew what this protein was, until in 2006, the laboratory of Virginia Lee in uh, uh, Philadelphia, they actually managed to purify these inclusions to a good enough grade. They injected mice in order to have monoclonal antibodies. They used the monoclonal antibodies to screen this ubiquitinated inclusion in the patients until they found a monoclonal antibody that was recognizing exactly these inclusions as they were recognized using a polyubiquitinated antibody, and then they mapped the protein against which this monoclonal antibody was directed. And the protein they found was this protein that nobody really expected, because until then the only protein known to have anything to do with ALS was an enzyme, was superoxide dismutase. This protein was called TDP43, TAR DNA binding protein 43. So, what, 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 uh, and how do we get into the picture? Well, we get into the picture because, first of all, this protein was identified uh, in, for the first time in the uh, mid 90s by people who were looking at the replication of the HIV 1 virus, and they basically found that this protein was capable of <coughs> binding, they hypothesized that this protein was capable of binding to the TAR. Uh, uh, DNA sequence of the virus and repressing the transcription. So that's the name, TDP43, and 43 stands for the molecular weight. Uh, now we know that this is actually not true because basically uh, some new analyses that were performed have actually completely uh, disproven the fact that this protein is capable of binding to the sequence and repressing HIV-1 uh, uh, replication. But in 2001, when I was a postdoc in the laboratory of Tito Baral in the lab, what we found is that this protein was actually capable of binding to a very specific UG-repeated RNA sequence in front of the exon 9 of CFTR exon 9 gene. And uh, when it was binding to this sequence, uh, it was capable of uh, inducing the skipping of exon 9 from the final RNA. 
Uh, and this skipping event is actually related to the occurrence of motor symptomatic forms of cystic fibrosis. So, uh, when in 2006 uh, this protein was actually discovered uh, uh, as part of the inclusions in the neurons of patients that uh, uh, are affected by ALS, what we started to do is to try and understand what this protein is actually doing, not in CFTR biology, but in uh, neuronal processing. Now, first of all, a few information on what is this protein. Basically, it's uh, some ways is a very characteristic uh, protein uh, typical of uh, HNRMP proteins because it has an N-terminus domain that is required, we know now, for oligomerization. It has a C-terminal tail that is mostly unstructured, where different proteins bind. And then there are two very uh, characteristic <coughs> RNA recognition <coughs> motifs that are used by this protein to bind RNA. And uh, you can see here a study that uh, uh, of Frederick Kallen and ETH, ETH in, in Switzerland, where we collaborated, where you can see how the two RRM of these proteins are actually binding specifically to a UG-rich RNA sequence, and you can see how both RRMs are actually, are actually contributing for the specificity, because you see how you know, the different nucleotides make direct contact with the RRM surfaces, and also you can see here that there is a um, a, a nucleotide that is uh, right actually in the cleft between the, R, the two RRMs. So both RRMs are contributing for this specificity. And using actually this structure, what we were able to find was to find a consensus binding sequence for this protein. And this allowed us, uh, and many other labs, uh, in addition to ours of course, to uh, find uh, what were the specific targets of TDP43 and how uh, TDP43 was affecting uh, RNA processes. And you can see here that, like many RNA binding proteins, TDP43 is actually affecting basically the entire uh, possibility of RNA processing, starting from splicing. Of course, we knew that from uh, 2000 and our early work. But uh, now uh, the new processing <coughs> elements include mic microRNA processing, long non-coding RNAs, it can uh, uh, active, um, affect stability, the transport. It, it is also very important for uh, translation and uh, for the stress granule uh, um, response to, to stresses. Now, uh, another important information that we got, knowing what the protein is, is the fact that aberrant uh, distribution of this protein does not just occur in ALS and in related neurodegenerative diseases. But very recently what was found is that it can also be found in the brain in some specialized Purkinje neurons in the brain of patients affected by Neiman Pick C and also in the um, uh, sarcoplasmic fibers uh, of patients who are affected by a number of myopathies, such as, for example, inclusion body myopathy. And this actually started uh, to uh, kind of understand how uh, an aberrant uh, processing of this RNA binding protein can lead to different types uh, of diseases. So, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, <coughs> it is now known uh, that together with the more classic tau and alpha synuclein pathologies, uh, there is in 40% of the patients about uh, uh, aggregations in the neurons uh, of uh, uh, these patients of TDP43, and this aggregation is directly related with cognitive ability. So the more TDP43 is aggregating in the brain of Alzheimer patients, in addition to tau and amyloid uh, deposits, the uh, less uh, this patient score in cognitive test. In the case of uh, uh, Neiman Pick C, I've already told you, this is a metabolic disease where basically the problem is a, a lysosomal storage disease. And in this case, uh, the neurological symptoms of this disease are 
related to the specific loss of Purkinje cells in the brain of the patients. And you can see how in uh, uh, normal patients uh, the Purkinje cells have TDP43, nothing in local, localized in the nucleus where it should be, but in, in a patient cells uh, the nucleus is almost empty and the TDP43 is all completely mislocalized in the cytoplasm. In the case of the uh, inclusion body myopathy patient, uh, this is quite interesting because, as you can imagine, one of the problems of looking at aggregation of this protein in the brain of patients is that it's not very easy to obtain samples from uh, human brains, especially when the people are alive. Uh, but in the case of muscles, of course, this is not true. And what one can do is to actually uh, look at the splicing events that occur in the, uh, in, in the muscle fibers of the patients that have the aggregates of TDP43, and you can see that those patients which have <coughs> the highest amount of aggregates, uh, if you look at some of the targets that we had identified thanks to our structural analysis, you can see that in these patients the splicing was selectively more impaired than in patients uh, of, uh, affected by inclusion body myopathy, which had lower amount of aggregates and free soluble TDP43. So this is the first indication that really aberrant RNA aggregation can occur in vivo. Now, um, I think I skip this. Uh, once you know what this protein is, what can you do? First of all, you can try and reproduce the aggregation. And uh, if you uh, want to think, if you think about what is triggering aggregation, well, there is no simple answer because basically these proteins, as I told you, as they have this C-terminal domain that is very uh, important for protein-protein interactions, uh, what happens is they have this tendency to oligomerize and to aggregate. So any stress or a lot of stress stresses that you can subject cells can, of course, lead to aberrant aggregation. And in particular, the regions that are involved in this aberrant aggregation are located both in the NTD, but also in the C-terminal domain. And in this C-terminal domain, what we did find in some follow-up studies on this aggregation potential of TDP43 was that there was this glutamine uh, and asparagine rich sequence that if you were to actually reproduce as a peptide was capable over time to uh, uh, form a beta structure that is typical of amyloid plaques that are, uh, I think all of you are familiar from your knowledge of Alzheimer's disease and you can see that if you leave these peptides long enough they form these typical fibrils that are very similar to the ones you find in the patients. And what, using this information, what we actually managed to do in the laboratory was to actually understand how these uh, beta fibrils can aggregate uh, uh, with each other, lead to a very compact uh, uh, aggregation uh, structure, and this can actually if you reproduce it in a cellular model, which is what we did, uh, once you trigger uh, using this seed sequence aggregation of TDP43 in the cytoplasm of cell, these aggregations are actually capable of completely sequestering the endogenous protein from the nucleus and trapping this protein in the cytoplasm, therefore uh, allowing basically to all the nuclear functions of TDP43 to be disrupted. And so the end result of this, uh, uh, of this analysis is that we now have a tool to understand exactly what are all the RNA processing events uh, mediated by TDP43, which become disrupted when this protein is aggregating in the cytoplasm. There is also another additional reason, although we are not working on this in the lab, why studying aggregation is important is because ALS, like many neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative diseases, is actually a spreading disease. So it has some prion-like properties. That is, aggregates from one cell will spread to another cell, and this will trigger neural, neuronal death in nearby brain regions. And this is why these, these neurodegenerative diseases get worse and worse over time. 
and uh, actually using uh, as a base the, uh, the C terminal <coughs> aggregates uh, of TDP43, you can see that in this case, these are this is a Japanese group. What they managed to reproduce is the spreading of the aggregates from cell to cell. But now that we know all the events that are controlled at the level of RNA metabolism by this protein, what can we tell about uh, the pathology? So how does this protein induce the pathology? And one way of uh, looking at the pathology is to look for mutations. Look for, looking for mutations that are associated with disease. And you can see here that uh, at present the situation is that there is a number of mutations that are being described to occur in patients. These mutations uh, are mostly localized in the C-terminal domain, so you would imagine that they have something to do with the aggregation or with the protein-protein uh, interaction properties of TDP43. And at present, we really don't know a lot about these mutations because most of them have been described. For only a few of them, uh, there have been uh, uh, animal models being made uh, that have been made and have been quite disappointing. I'll show you this uh, uh, in a few minutes. But uh, for most of them, we simply don't know what they're doing. So we took advantage of a collaboration that uh, we had with Bernardino Getty and Casey Newell in Indiana University, where they brought to our attention the fact that, that uh, an ALS patient, unfortunately a very young girl when she was 22, so ALS normally is a disease that occurs to people when they are in their 50s, so this was a very early case of ALS, they described uh, that the presence of a mutation that is uh, in position 375 of the C-terminal domain of TDP43, where you have this uh, serine that is turned into a, a glycine. And uh, if you look at the databases that are available with regards to the variants of TDP43 that are found in ALS patients, you see that based on the bioinformatic analysis, this uh, variation was actually classified as very rare and possibly neutral or benigne variant. But the fact that we could find it in a very young case of ALS, uh, so she was 22 at the time when the first symptoms appeared, uh, made us think a little bit differently. And so we said, what can this uh, uh, mutation tell us about the pathology of TDP43? And uh, Basically, this is just a clinical slide telling you a little bit about the uh, uh, disease course uh, in this patient, where that was very normal. The first symptoms appeared in 22, and unfortunately she passed away in 25. But this patient was you know, very cooperative, and what happened is that she left all her entire body for research. And so we were able to obtain from all the different brain regions and from all the different other organs, a sample of, uh, uh, of, of her body that we could then use to analyze. And I'll show you the results in a little while. First of all, although we wanted to know what is mutation doing, right, in, uh, in a, a, and how is it affecting the uh, property of TDP43. And this is the work that Francesca Paron is now doing in the lab. Well, first of all, we thought, well, maybe it's changing the localization of uh, uh, TDP43 in cells. But when we made a recombinant uh, uh, protein, we really didn't see any difference with regards to the one type protein. Then we said, okay, maybe it's altering splicing. But the, in this case, we also used an add back system. So basically, a system where we can measure a, the ability of TDP43 protein to induce CFTR exonine skipping. And you can see here that if you uh, compare the splicing inhibition of a one type TDP43 with a TDP43 that is carrying these mutations, they all look very similar, right? This is a positive control where we artificially mutated the RRMs of TDP43, so it cannot bind anymore. And you can see here at the uh, level of splicing is completely dead. So uh, basically this change does not alter uh, 
the, 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 these basic properties of TDP for disease. So what is it that it could alter? Well, first of all, what we did uh, is to check for toxicity. Is this protein, is this toxic, or is it really a Benign variant, like it was described in databases. And you can see here from a toxic assay that really it was as toxic as other real disease associated <coughs> mutations of TDP43, so there is something there. And therefore, we turned at the level of the protein. And uh, luckily for us, uh, several other groups had started mapping the phosphorylation profile of this protein. You can see here that if you phosphorylate this protein in vitro, or you look at phosphorylation in uh, these protein aggregates in the brain of patients, the serine in position 375 actually is always phosphorylated, either by Kaizen kinase 1, in the case of in vitro, or by uh, different types of uh, kinases uh, in the two ALS cases. So we said, well, what happens if we actually phosphomimic uh, this, uh, uh, the, we make a phosphomimic of this protein, so the change would abolish the ability of this serine to be phosphorylated if we change this serine into a, uh, as, uh, in, into a glutamic acid, uh, what happens to, to this protein? And what happens to this protein, this is an experiment that Francesca did in the lab, is actually that it is in 50% of the cases, it is aberrantly translocated in the cytoplasm, a little bit reminding what we see in two patients. And um, if, you, uh, if you look at that, the, the experiments are still ongoing, but uh, this gave us an idea of interpreting many of the disease-associated mutations of TDP43 that have been found so far in patients, because you see here that if you look at all these mutations, a great proportion of these mutations either involves uh, the loss of a serine residue, so a potential phosphorylation site, the introduction of a serine residue, so the, uh, uh, the gaining of a new <coughs> phosphorylation site, or in some cases you have the insertion of an aspartic or glutamic acid and therefore making a phosphomimic. And uh, if you were wondering if there is something wrong with the phosphorylation of this protein in patient, well, because we had available the uh, many, many different regions from this patient that carry this mutation, what we did was to compare the profile of the phosphorylation profile of TDP43 uh, in the brain of the patient and compare it to the expression profile of TDP43 uh, uh, in, the, in the same regions of this patient. And you can see here that really there is no relation between the two. So in the motor uh, cortex, uh, where you have most of the neuronal loss, that is the one causing ALS, you have a very high amount of aberrant phosphorylation, whereas the, you don't have in the primary motor cortex a very huge level of TDP43 expression, because in all these brain regions, the highest level is in the dentate nucleus, where you can see we had enough material to actually do a western blot. You can see there is a huge amount of protein, but the levels of phosphorylated TDP43 is, is very low. Uh, and uh, third, and, and I think also very interesting observation, if you look at all these ALS, uh, uh, all these neurodegenerative and non neurodegenerative uh, other types of diseases like myopathies or metabolic diseases, and you look for what is the most aberrant post translational modification of this protein, really the only answer is aberrant phosphorylation. So, how do these mutations work? Right? Do they gain or do they act as a loss of function? So, they induce aggregation and therefore they deplete. Uh, uh, they the nuclear functions of TDP43 activity, or do they induce uh, some new uh, properties, some, uh, or they give some new properties to TDP43 and therefore induce cellular death, cell death? And this is something that we have been uh, investigating by collaborating with people in the UK at Harwell, where basically uh, we were testing for. Uh, um, mutations, artificial mutations in TDP43. And what these people have done since uh, many, many years, now of course people use CRISPR-Cas9, 
is to actually use ENU mutagenesis to induce uh, artificial mutations in all the proteins of the mouse genome. And therefore, if you are interested in knowing what a protein is doing, uh, you can go to their data bank, you can select the gene you want to study, you can look what kind of mutations have been randomly inserted in these mice, and then you can order the embryo, grow the mice, and see what is the uh, uh, phenotype of these mice. And uh, I will tell you a very long story short, because we analyzed the mutations for about uh, two years, uh, both uh, here in ICGB and in the UK, and in the end, what we ended up was two mutations that were active in a both loss and gain of function at the level of TDP43. So we had one mutation here in uh, the RRM1 region, that is the phenylanolin into position 210, that was changed into a isoleucin, where if we made a splicing assay using this mutation, the ability of TDP43 to inhibit CFTR exon 9 was lower than the wild type. So this is a loss of function mutation. And after this, it's a loss of function. Why? Because a change of a phenylalanine to a nucleusin was actually decreasing the ability of TDP43 to bind RNA. And then, what was more interesting, what we found is another artificial mutation, so these are not mutations that are found in patients, where basically we had a change in the C-terminal domain this time. This was a methionine in position 323 that was changing to a lysine, and this one was actually <coughs> acting as a gay, as making TDP43 more efficient in uh, uh, inhibiting CFTR exon 9, and I'll show you this in a minute. So the reason why uh, uh, this is uh, causing TDP43 to be more efficient, we still don't really know, but what we know is that this uh, uh, um, change here can affect the oligomerization properties of TDP43. So probably making it uh, more likely to uh, bind cooperatively on an RNA binding site and therefore be more active at the splicing level. And you can see here how these two uh, mutations compare to each other. So if this is a CFTR exon 9 splicing profile where you have inclusion here, skipping here, if you uh, look at uh, this, in this case, uh, cells from the heterozygous and homozygous mice embryo, you can see that in the homozygous condition, there is uh, no skipping of CFTR exon 9 for the loss of function mutation, but for the gain of function mutation, you can see that almost all CFTR exon 9 is completely skipped, <coughs> and you have to compare this to the wild type uh, control, of course, uh, skipping levels. And so, what is the phenotype of these mice? And this is quite interesting because, first of all, for the gain of function mouse, this is completely lethal. So, we could never get a homozygous mice carrying this mutation here because it just didn't develop. But for the loss of function mouse, this was a little bit less severe, and we managed to get a mouse that was dying, uh, but it was dying uh, a little bit later than, uh, um, than real knockout mice, because knockout mice are, for TDP43 are lethal at a very early ever stage. In this case, the loss of function mutations basically had a delay in development where the mouse died around 18.5, at the stage of 18.5, and basically due to the fact that the, uh, the central nervous system could not keep up uh, with, development, with development compared to the wild type mouse. So, the fact that we managed to get uh, uh, at least uh, homozygous cells for these two mutations, what allowed us to do is to actually may perform RNA sec analysis and look what are the consequences of having loss of function of this new uh, protein compared to gain of function. And let me start first with the loss of function. And the loss of functions, as you can imagine, uh, like I told you, this protein is uh, regulating hundreds of uh, RNA processing events. You, therefore, you have lots of changes, genes that are uh, whose splicing is 
both upregulated or downregulated. Most uh, of the problems have to do with genes that have uh, long introns. So uh, uh, basically, what happens is if you have, and this I think is intuitively logical, if you have a protein that is not capable of binding RNA as efficiently as the wild type, then of course the long introns. Uh, uh, events that are controlled by these proteins are going to be more severely affected than the, the events that concern short introns. But also, what is interesting is that this uh, uh, loss of function protein had a lot of exon skipping events and a lot of cryptic exons. So basically, uh, what happens is that a lot of exons which are normally repressed by TDP43 these are not present anymore. Now, can we actually balance uh, the loss of function and the gain of function? And as I told you, if we have loss of function mice, they are uh, homozygous mice, they are embryonic lethal, so you don't actually, you cannot get uh, uh, any mice uh, with uh, F210 uh, uh, live mice. Uh, with the loss of function mutations, nor any mice with the gain of function mutations. But if you breed the heterozygous, what you do get is you start getting some viable mice. So gain of function and loss of function, at least at the level of uh, uh, these regulated genes, uh, they can somehow compensate each other a little bit. And you can see here from the data, so basically if you have the uh, loss of function embryo and gain of function embryos, you can see that in both of them you have hundreds of dysregulated uh, exons and splicing events. And when you cross the heterozygous to have the hybrid loss and gain of function mice, these uh, high, very high number of dysregulated events, they actually goes almost down to zero. This is why you start to get some <coughs> mice. But still, you don't get what you would expect, that is, 25%. Because what happens <coughs> is that you cannot compensate the specific effects of TDP43 loss of function and gain of function because, uh, for example, in the gain of function mice, you don't see problems at the level of the long introns that I told you is a characteristic of the loss of function mice. And uh, in the uh, in the, in the loss of function mice, of course, what you don't get uh, is the cryptic exons that are very prominent uh, and very highly represented uh, in the loss of function mice. But what you get uh, is the gain of function mice uh, is the fact that you have, because this protein is more able than the wild type to uh, repress the splicing, is you have the uh, appearance of skeptic uh, exons, that is, normal exons that become skipped in an aberrant manner, that are actually completely, almost completely absent in the loss of function mice. And so what happens, you see that both gain of function and loss of functions, although they are specific, right, uh, although they can be complemented, they are also certainly specific for these two uh, possibilities, that is, the introduction of, uh, of uh, cryptic exons, but also uh, because they are more abundant uh, in the loss of function mice than in the gain of function mice, and uh, the presence of uh, aberrant, uh, uh, of aberrant normal exons that become skipped that are much more uh, common in the gain of function mice as opposed to the loss of function mice. And uh, the last thing that this is something that could be important for the disease is the fact that uh, the, uh, these exons that become uh, prevalently skipped in the, uh, in the gain of function mice, they, if you look at where they occur, they occur in proteins that are involved in the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. So this is a direct link with regards to the formation of aggregates of TDP43 in the neurons and therefore the eventual death uh, of the neurons by the uh, aberrant changes induced by these aggregates. So, uh, what, what, what can we say about uh, the, the importance of 
TV of RNA binding proteins in your degeneration. You can see here from this uh, kind of analysis of all the genes that are known until this moment to be involved in ALS, there is the fact that you have not just uh, TDP43 protein, although this is the protein that is aggregating uh, in 97% of the neurons of the patients, but you also have the involvement of several other RNA binding proteins like trans CNNR, the, uh, these are intronic repeats in the CNNR72 genes and matrix 3. And therefore, if you want to really think about ALS what, and about the great variability of uh, how RNA binding proteins can, or the variability of the disease, you can see that now, hopefully, knowing that in TDP43 you can have gain or loss of function scenarios depending on uh, uh, the mutation that is present in the protein, depending on the post-translational modification that are present on the protein. And then if you think that there are several other RNA binding proteins that are uh, genetically linked to the disease, now finally what we can start to understand is the reason why if you look at the clinical onset of ALS, you have these huge changes both in the age of onset, so you can have very young people who develop ALS or very old people who develop ALS. The way that the disease also spreads, so depending on the brain region that is affected, the disease will affect mostly you know, the entire body, just the lower part, uh, or, and so on. And finally, the idea is that if the day we can manage to understand how all these proteins relate to each other, how they relate to the RNA processing events inside neurons, and how they are modified in the disease, both by mutations or for translational modifications, finally we will be able to make some sense of uh, this incredible complexity here that until now was completely unexplained. Uh, and so, uh, right on time, let me just uh, thank the people uh, without whom none of this work would have been done. So, of course, my people in the molecular pathology uh, lab, Casey Newell and Dino Getty in Indianapolis and Kansas City, they are the ones who are working on this uh, novel mutation, in this very young case of ALS. Pietro Fratta, Lizzie Fisher and Abraham Acevedo in the UK. And then, uh, of course, these are the foundations that are supporting uh, our research. And with this, I think I'll finish and I'll accept questions.